So here we have it, a void. Uh, an unexpected space. So just notice your reactions. What are your thoughts and feelings as you sit waiting? Now you know this is an experiment. Be aware of how you feel with the silence and a known space. Now take a few moments to share this with the person next to you. Share your experiences now. Great. Thank you very much for joining me in that little experiment on our topic today. I'd, I'd like to just check out um, your reactions. How many people were a little bit concerned and worried? Just put your hand up. Especially my process group from yesterday. I'm hoping they were concerned about where I was. How many people were a bit irritated or impatient? You know, what the hell is going on here? Let's get on with it. Very, very typical of uh, organizations and people who want to, you know, just get on. How many people were cool and chill and say, yeah, whatever, I'll just check my Facebook while I'm waiting? <laughs> and how many people were still Relaxed, simply waiting and present. Ah, lovely, lovely. Okay, so this is our topic. And my objective here is to explore the meaning of this beautiful and poetic term, fertile void. I, I'm not going to talk about models and theories but really to share my journey <clears throat> over the next, over the last 40 years, and especially over the last 18 months when I was asked to give this keynote, it, it set me really thinking. I, I had, um, okay. I had written my book, The Fertile Void, but, but at that point, I just used it as a concept, as a basis for talking about Gestalt in coaching. Uh, <clears throat> because I was really interested in making uh, Gestalt accessible to people that uh, were not familiar with it. So I'm hoping that uh, my presentation will uh, give you some insights uh, and more importantly questions so that you can take these questions out into the conference over the next two days and explore them in some of the 160 workshops that are available to us. Now, in terms of the structure, uh, I'd like to share four quotes that have a really profound impact on me over the last 30 years. I'd like to then look at, well, how fertile is our voids? And especially those that we work with with our clients. Is growth the movement from the sterile to the fertile void? I'd like to then take you on a little guided visualization to experience <clears throat> the fertile void. And finally, introduce you to two teachers that uh, have given me so much 
in terms of understanding this notion of the fertile void space. So now you can relax. Those that were a little bit anxious and uptight, you can chill because now you know what's coming uh, and you don't have to be worried about any unexpected voids from me anyway. Um, so, the first quote. This is something that now is within our, my whole family as, um, life. I, a Middle Eastern saying, obviously, very common. Trust the Lord and tie up your camel. We believe that the roads are going to be safe, so we, but we still put on our seatbelt, we still put on our cycle helmet. We talk a lot about trusting the process. This is the basis of our gestalt, and uh, in the workshops, you will meet lots of other, lots of opportunities for sitting in that space that we started with and exploring the space and trusting the process. That comes from a belief in the void, in the fertile void, the belief in the outcome. But we do tie up our camels. We do come prepared. We have done our training. We've been here before. We know how to manage and create the possibilities for this to be a fertile place. But how much do you go with the process? And how much do you trust? So in preparing for this presentation, at one point, I thought I'd just walk on, sit in the chair, and just trust the process. Have a sort of a dialogue with you. Uh, but then I didn't trust myself. I didn't trust my memory. I didn't, oh, well, will I remember? Will I think? So I played safe. I prepared. I got my notes together. I love uh, the film, The Best Marigold Hotel. I don't know whether you're familiar with that. The key character says, it will be all right in the end. And if it's not all right, it's not the end. <laughs> so how far do we go with trusting the process? Do we wait till the end or do we make some intervention? I was also struck by the opposite notion the, the sentence, the phrase that if good people do nothing, evil prevails. So it's really the opposite. It's not fertile. There is danger out there. And we talk a lot about the organism environment field. And what about the wider environment? What would happen if we do nothing? If we don't actually have some concern for what's going to happen in the world. If we sit back and just trust the process. Now maybe our belief in organismic self-regulation will mean that we'll be okay. The scientists will do something and we will save our planet. But maybe we do have to do something. And this afternoon, outside uh, Budapest Parliament, there will be a major demonstration, a global demonstration of children protesting about their future in this world. I have to say I made a, a tiny contribution, uh, which I'd like to thank the organizers for. I came here by train, and we'll go back by train. It took 24 hours to get here, which wasn't, you know, it's quite good. I did lots of preparation, but it cost five times the price. So the organizer supported me in my travel, and I feel like I make a small contribution, even though I can't be at the demonstration this afternoon here in Budapest. I would have been if I was in London. It's important for us to think, as uh, Zolti said at the beginning, to think environmentally. I'd like to... Um, Sorry. Uh -huh. 
know something has happened. Ah. So, sorry, a slight glitch there in my, my slide presentation. This you're all familiar with, the paradox of change. Change occurs when we become who we are and not when we try to be what we are not. I think, for me, this articulates an aspect of human development that's not addressed by any other psychology discipline. I find it central to my process of working with myself and with my clients. It's, it's an emergent process that I practice. But for years, I didn't get the second part. Not when you try to be what you're not. Because I know that I can make change when I try. With effort, I can be different. We're all here learning and practicing, discovering new aspects of Gestalt and learning to be different. I dance tango and I know that I have to practice. I have a good colleague who's a Zen tango teacher and he says, practice, practice, practice. I have to do stuff in order to get better, to change myself. If I want to be healthy, I've got to work at it. I've got to go to the gym. I've got to stay on a diet. Even meditation, we have to practice finding that still place. There's a whole branch of motivational psychology that I'm involved in because I work in business. And the, you may be familiar with the, the phrase, fake it till you make it. We can change our minds through our bodies. So I've come to a different understanding of the second part of this uh, paradox of change. I've called it now the choice of change. Because yes, change happens without effort. It's central to humanistic psychology and it's central to coaching practice. This notion of active listening or appreciative inquiry. Here we sit with our clients and we're simply accepting and attending to who they are and how they are being in our presence. And what happens? They change. They relax, they open up, they discover something else about themselves. So we know that change does occur without effort when we simply accept who we are. But we can also make change happen. It takes effort. We can manifest our visions. We can trust the Lord and tie up our camel. We can do something and make an effort. And I think there's something in this about the balance between effort and simply being present. Now, excuse me, because I've got to reorganize my slides. Thank you. This is another phrase that uh, I came across um, in the US and the, on the East Coast, uh, the Shaker community, I don't know whether you're familiar with Shakers, their furniture, Shaker furniture was very much in vogue 10 years ago. Their philosophy was you've got to work, prepare as if you will live 100 years. You put the effort in, you make plans, you structure. I work a lot in organizations where we prepare, prepare visions, we prepare strategies. But the other element is, and we could die tomorrow. We have to be prepared for the unknown, for the unexpected, and hold that in a balance between preparing and being present, living in the here and now and for the moment. Now, I never actually use this quote in organizations, but I do hold it in my mind a lot because organizations now are striving to be what they call agile. 
to be adaptive because we live in what's now commonly called the VUCA world. VUCA means volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous. And organizations know about this. Now, of course, we have a wonderful political situation in my country called Brexit. And if we were looking for a greater VUCA opportunity, then we are living through it at this very moment. I haven't checked my phone today to see what's happened to Boris Johnson, um, but something dramatic will happen. So we don't know. We're living in that space. And I work with organizations. I coach individuals who are struggling with that uncertainty and helping them balance being present in the moment with making realistic plans of how to deal with this uncertainty. I was impressed with the Apple founder Steve Jobs saying, contemplating my death clarifies my priorities. This is a quote that, again, has made a huge impact on me and what I think of my life and my journey. To know myself is half the way to God. For God put in enlightenment, sense of peace. But to lose myself and all the way is trod, the journey is complete. So for the bulk of my gestalt, life experience, it's about getting to know who am I? What is this self? The paradox of change, become who I am. But I'm discovering also that there's another part, there's the letting go of my ego identity. This part that is of no effort. I was a Quaker for some 20 years, which was very much about finding my inner voice, the voice of God. Now, recently I've become atheist, I don't have a God. I find that just being alive and present in the moment and seeing where that takes me is enough. And I'm much more drawn to Buddhism where there's a profound focus on this notion of emptiness, where there is no voice. In Taoism, the wu-wi, the no-thingness. In this case, it's a sort of transcendent place where I think, and this is where I'm still on my journey, that I become part of the void, the oneness with creation. I love the fact that in studying Buddhism um, on this journey, I discovered that the Buddha offered 84,000 paths to enlightenment. And I think since him, we've probably had at least another 84,000. So we've well over 160,000 routes to finding our way to this oneness. Um, so uh, I think I might be on route uh, 235. Uh, but, <laughs> but you know, I'm not here to expound on the way or a way, but there, it's like in Gestalt, you're finding your way, your journey, your plan. But, you know, it's all very well for us to talk about losing ourselves, but what about the void if it's dangerous? Do some of us and our, especially our clients experience it as an awesome whole. In PTSD and depression, I know from the program that there are a number of workshops exploring this very issue. How fertile is our void? I have a friend who's uh, grappling with complex PTSD, the result of childhood abuse. He's discovered that he copes by being disassociated, shut off from himself. 
And there's a wonderful book uh, by Van der Kult called The Body Holds the Score. So even though his desire is to be present, his body holds the terror and the emptiness. And this friend is actually hugely successful. He's financially secure, he's got a great family, but still inside there is this terror. So does current reality help us? Does it have an influence? Coming back to knowing yourself, Fritz talked about, and we heard it from Nancy earlier, that growth is potentially moving from a sterile to a fertile void. So is it a state of mind? We heard yesterday about the, the prospect of, of constructive anxiety. Anxiety has blocked excitement. My friend calls incubation. The, the sitting at the impasse before the birth, the explosion, as Nancy talked about, into this fertile space. But Fritz also talked, said, if we leave the safety of the present, we can fall prey to the fantasy fears of the past and the future. So we have those experiences of the awesome whole that come from terrifying past experience that we live with at the moment. But let's consider what happens if the current reality, our current space, is unsafe. We've heard about the refugees, the conflicts in the world, and to a certain extent, I lived through some of that in Northern Ireland. Can we, in those circumstances, create a structure of possibilities that Nancy talked about yesterday? And clearly, yes, we can. There are countless examples of people who have overcome immense suffering, religious persecution. And in fact, our role model in Christianity is Jesus. You know, how about that? You know, overcoming the his death, cruel death, in order to rise again. So we have this wonderful uh, opportunity in Christianity for a fertile void in heaven. And we have wonderful icons like Gandhi, who advocated non-direct action and being prepared to suffer and also rising above that to find a stillness, a peace, a fertile void. And I was hugely impressed with uh, Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning, where he found a place, an, an inner place of peace and understanding with himself, even in the midst of a horrific situation. So the fertile void, I think, is a state of mind that can be independent of relationships and circumstances. We heard yesterday that often we talk about the fertile void as being relational. So I've been curious about that. I think, yes, in terms of getting to know myself, absolutely. But maybe in the losing of myself, we give up on the relational aspect and we find somewhere deeper inside. Now, I'd like to do another experiment with you. This is quite predictable. I'm going to take you or invite you to join me on a guided visualization. And this is a visualization I did, wow, in the, in the early 80s with um, a guy called Frank Lake who was doing rebirthing. And 
I had this amazing experience of freedom and um, just openness. And I hold this uh, periodically in my mind. And I'd like to offer you the opportunity to see whether you too could find this a free, fertile space. And we're going to look at the moment of conception and the initial embryonic journey. Okay? So if you're up for this, take a moment, close your eyes. If you're not, you can check your phone. But just take a moment And I'd like you to first of all imagine in your one hand or the other, choose a hand, a single cell that is you, that was you, sitting there, fertile, still, and ready. And now, in the other hand, I want you to be your sperm that is full of energy and drive and determination to get to that cell. And see if you can hold for a moment the both, the polarities of the stillness and the energy. And then they come together. You come together. Maybe bring your hands together. Feel that uh, the connection, the energy that comes from the sperm connecting with the egg, the yin and the yang coming as one, and the explosion of cells as they divide and grow and multiply without effort. You need do nothing. So this microcosmic bundle of cells moves down the fallopian tube and into the womb. So just let yourself be in that space of floating, floating in this fertile space. You've nowhere to go. You know that the next stage will be the implantation into the wall of the womb. But for now, you are just simply being in that space. So I leave you for a couple of moments to make of this what you will. That's the end of the visualization and the space where I think is absolutely about the fertile void. Okay, and I draw to a close. Finally, I'd like to introduce you to two of my teachers around the experience of being in the fertile void. Being with them and entering into their world. The first is my mother. She was 93 when she died a few years ago. She had a loving heart, but she was deeply dissatisfied and disappointed with her life, with her husband, and with her son. She did not understand what on earth I was doing in this area. So she was always very critical, and so most of my life with her was a bit of a battle, very unsatisfying for both of us, and I spent many years 
and a lot of money and therapy getting to some terms with this, as I'm sure you'll know. However, a miracle happened. She got Alzheimer's. Now, Alzheimer's can be a very difficult and destructive condition, but she had what I can only call as happy Alzheimer's. In that, she forgot what she was dissatisfied with. <laughs> she forgot what she thought I should be and was simply delighted to see me. That essence of her loving heart just came out. She lived in a community with um, about 15 other people and she was loved and she loved them. She was just simply there in the moment and every time I went to see her, she would be delighted to meet me. I would go out to the loo for something. I'd come back again and say, oh, John, how lovely to see you. Let's have a cup of tea. So this was a wonderful experience, just being with her in the simplicity of being in the moment. The other a uh, person I want to share with you, my other guru, I'm delighted I've known now for two years, lives very close to me, so <clears throat> I see him every day. <clears throat> Sorry, well, mostly on the Mondays we, we sit down and we have breakfast and I spend time just being present and sharing in a very simple way, a connection and just seeing the world as it is and just experiencing the joy of being alive in the moment. And fortunately, I have a very short clip of this experience, so I'd like to share this with you now. And it's a clip that uh, is important to me. We have the sign, please. Now, those of you who are grandparents will be very familiar with their little gurus that help them come back into the present. What's interesting about both of these is that they are living in the moment, but totally dependent on the world around them to be fertile. They can be in that space provided there is a relationship that is also rich and full of possibilities. They're unconscious of their condition unlike Frankl and other enlightened people who transcend their emotional space and physical conditions in terms of losing themselves. So I'd like to close with my conclusion to date. In this journey from the sterile void where I'm beginning to know myself, somewhere there in the middle, we create a fertility that's about our connection, our understanding of ourselves, creating good relationships. And then there's something else about transcending, about moving beyond, about losing ourselves to this oneness with creation. Now, I think, you know, I'm 65, so I think maybe if I consider a 100-year span, I'm 65% of the way there. So. Um, invite me back in another decade and I can tell you where I've got to <laughs> on this journey of losing myself. And I know from experience this is not linear. <laughs> it's going to go backwards and forwards. And it will do, of course, for you as well. And of course, your clients are very much on this journey and most of your work will be in that first phase of how do we get to the zero point. So we're not going to have questions. 
which I think is brilliant actually because what I would like and prefer is that you take the questions that I hope I've stimulated for you and take them out into the conference. There are 160 workshops happening here. At least 30 of them have void or fertile in their title. So you have plenty of opportunities to explore and challenge and question many of these different aspects. And I'd like to close by sharing my video again of my young guru. Have we got the sign? Thank you very much indeed.